So if you did not bring a Bible with you, there are Bibles underneath the seats in front of you, and you can take one of those out. And if you do not own a Bible, we would love for you to take one of those home as a gift from us. Isaiah chapter 3, starting in verse 1, we are going to go through the whole chapter, and we are going to even skip into, not skip, but we're going to jog into uh, chapter 4, first few verses of chapter 4. And how we're going to do this today is uh, I'll read some of it, then we'll, we'll talk about it, and then I'll read some more. But I'll just, just keep your finger there, and we'll, we'll walk through this together. Isaiah 3, Isaiah 3, verse 1 is where you need to get right now. If you see in your bulletin there, I, I just ended up calling this the deepening force of loss and increase. And I believe the longer that you are a Christian you will understand that God knows how to enrich us in life through loss. God knows how to enrich us, build us up through loss. And how many of you would agree that sometimes God takes away more than we wish he would? Yes. But then we find out that he's only giving us more of himself forever. Jim Elliott found that out, and as serving the Lord in missions, Jim Elliott said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And we, we will not gain what we cannot lose without giving up what we cannot keep. Loss for the sake of gain. That is the way of God for us. And sometimes God seems very severe in that. And it's only because of his love, his love that's so intense, his creativity so colorful, that God settles for nothing less than our complete life, our complete then salvation. A writer in the mid-1950s said this, imagine yourself living in a house. Okay, we can do that. So everyone place yourself in that house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, Perhaps you can understand what he is doing. He is getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing and so you were not surprised and you were quite happy. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts and does not seem to make sense. And you begin to ask, what on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were going to be made into a decent little cottage for a new place. But what did he say in scripture? He's building a palace. He intends to come and live in that himself. And that is actually the force of what Isaiah 3 is saying for us today. That we need to lose a lot to gain even more. Verses 1 through 15 are very interesting in that it shares this loss of permanent, permanency. Look at verse 1 with me for just a moment. For behold, the Lord God of hosts is going to remove from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support, the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water. Now, this section that we're going to read here in just a moment 
is surrounded by this Lord of hosts phrase. Verse 1, verse 15. And the prophet Isaiah here envisions this powerful event, the powerful Lord taking something away from his people. What does it say there in verse 1? What do they stand to lose? Supply, support. And those two words in the original language, Hebrew, that are repeated in Isaiah's text are once in masculine form and then again in feminine form. And the Lord is taking away everything of these people, His people. He's taking away everything that stabilizes the corporate life of Isaiah's generation. All supply of bread, all support of water. And he's talking about the Assyrian invasion with all of its destabilization and the impact of that. And God then explains the meltdown. He's taking away their leaders. Let's start in verse 2. The mighty man and the warrior, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of 50 and the honorable man, the counselor and expert artisan, and the skillful enchanter. And then what does he do? He replaces them with irresponsible boys. Look at verse 4. And I will make mere lads their princes. And capricious children will rule over them. And then the social structure with that type of leadership, what happens? It dissolves. Verse 5, and the people will be oppressed, each one by another, and each one by his neighbor. The youth will storm against the elder and the inferior against the honorable. And really in this desperation that follows in the scenario that happened the people will look for someone for anyone to provide guidance and courage but no one is going to be willing look at verse 6 when a man lays hold of his brother in his father's house saying you have a cloak you shall be our ruler and these ruins will be under your charge he will protest on that day saying i will not be your healer for in my house there is neither bread nor cloak. You shall not appoint me ruler of the people. What's going on here is a warning for every generation. That generation and the generations that have followed. One way that God judges is depriving them of worthy leaders. And the center of that society no longer holds together. We need to pause and ponder this for a moment. One way God judges his people is by depriving them of worthy leaders. I'm going to pick up a big rock and throw it right now. And I'm throwing it north across the border to a Mr. Trudeau. Canada, a young guy that's a disaster, that actually has said that his ideal person to lead is the dictator of China. He said that just recently as he got voted in. And you can see just the chaos that's going on up there. And matter of fact, go all the way back to verse 1. I just think this is kind of interesting. Both supply and support are going to be gone. What's going on up there right now? Some truckers. Some problems with moving things. Food, water, different things that are needed back and forth. And you're going, oh wow. Our God, who is the same, what? What? Yesterday, today, and forever, he's moving. He's moving and saying, all right, here we go. I will remove. I will remove. 
just a few days ago, there were some pastors up there that wrote an open letter to Prime Minister Trudeau. Very solid guys, one of them, Tim Stevens, who was arrested once for having church and then arrested a second time because a helicopter found them having church outside. All right? I want you to hear what these pastors said to the leader there, I think it's two days ago. In recent weeks, the hugely popular truckers' convoy containing many Christians, including pastors, has captured the imagination not only of this nation, but other nations around the world, laying bare that what we have expressed and argued for months, and let's talk about them as pastors, is indeed representative of the concerns of millions of ordinary Canadians who value peace, personal responsibility, and liberty. The Ottawa protest has presented your government with a wonderful opportunity to meet with and speak to ordinary Canadians lawfully and peaceably requiring the restoration of their constitutional rights. However, in response to their singing and praying and dancing and candy floss and bouncy castles, speeches about the Constitution and outpourings of patriotic love for this country, your government has not only refused to meet with these citizens to hear their concerns, you have insulted, denigrated, and lied about them, further dividing and hurting a broken nation. These are pastors speaking to him. I would require this takes a lot of guts. I would say it takes a lot of guts to say this. Especially this next paragraph. As ambassadors of Christ, while we respect your office as a public servant and honor the limited role of civil authority as a ministry of public justice, we do not hesitate to fulfill our responsibility as servants of the living God by unapologetically reminding you that Jesus Christ is Lord and King. And He is the ruler and King of this earth. And that He sets up kings and pulls down the mighty from their thrones, and none can stay His hand. Probably didn't go over well. But the thing we need to remember, this is, just, this is going on now, right? This is going on as we speak. And I'm reading Isaiah 3, and I'm going, oh boy. And one of the things that we need to understand is that history indicates that prosperity and longevity is not guaranteed to any nation at all. A nation will flourish or the disappearing of that flourishing will depend on what? The behavior of its people and the wisdom of its leaders. God enables a nation to prosper for as long as the majority of the people are honorable, living right, and making wise choices. We see this here in Isaiah 3. Think of the billions of decisions, the actions, the consequences that occur every day within every nation, right? Think of the billions of decisions. If a million immoral decisions are made each day, a million evil consequences will follow. It's just the law of cause and effect that cannot be broken whatever we see we we sow we reap whatever we sow we reap galatians 6 7 and 8 and that axiom is true for individuals and it's true for governments and what we see here in the first few verses that we've gone through is that trustworthy leaders are gifts from god and i would say just reading that letter from those 29, it was only 29 pastors that signed that. It's only 29. The New Testament says that God gives us the most important type of leaders of all. Apostles, 
prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. What are they to do to lead us to him? That's the heart of spiritual leadership. And that's what those pastors are doing. But sometimes that isn't what God's people want. And what we see then in verses 8 through 11 is Isaiah identifying the reason for the illness at his time. The reason for the illness at his time. And the key is that last line of verse 8 that we uh, are going to look at. So this leader, this, this leader that is not qualified to lead, who protests on that day in verse 7, I will not be your healer, for in my house there is neither bread nor cloak. You shall not appoint me ruler of the people. Verse 8, for Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen because their speech and their actions are against the Lord to rebel against his glorious presence. Literally, that phrase means defying the eyes of his glory. So Isaiah's contemporaries are resisting God's relevance in their life to the whole life, to the eyes of his glory. Rebelling, as the New American Standard says there, against his glorious presence. You see, they wanted to be forgiven, yes. They want to be protected, yes. But they didn't want God to be too real. They wanted to compartmentalize God. That is what did them in. You see, the pagan cultures really at that point weren't the problem. Why blame external forces when the people of God were bringing evil on themselves? Verse 9, the expression of their faces bear witness against them. And they display their sin like Sodom. They do not even conceal it. Woe to them, for they have brought evil on themselves. But, verses 10 and 11 remind us of something. God is still present, even in the midst of that. Still at work. Say to the righteous that it will go well with them, for they will eat the fruit of their actions. Woe to the wicked, it will go badly with him, for what he deserves will be done to him. In verses 12 through 15, then, the Lord exposes these leaders. They, too, answer to God because he loves his people. We feel his love in the words of my people that we see in verse 12 and verse 15. His people in verse 14. Oh, my people, their oppressors are children and women rule over them. O oh, my people, those who guide you, lead you astray and confuse the direction of your paths. Once again, we got to pause and go, this sounds eerily familiar to our day and age. Would you agree with me that we have leaders that are guiding people astray? confusing the direction of their paths. And you know what, everyone? I'm not talking about government leaders. I'm talking about pastors. I'm talking about whole movements of churches that are leading people away from God and His Word. And it's the saddest thing on the planet. I I would argue, as we go down here in verse 13, some of your Bibles may say these three words as a, a break there, God will judge. 
verse 13, the Lord arises to contend and stands to judge the people. The Lord enters into judgment with the elders and the princes of his people. It is you who have devoured the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the face of the poor, declares the Lord God of hosts. You can just, you can hear God's anger, his loving anger. Jesus was like that as well. John 10, 10 and 11. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. We like hanging out in the last parts of those verses, but it starts off with stealing and killing and destroying being done. And Jesus provides the true leadership needed. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That's leadership. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That is leadership. Those 29 pastors up in Canada... You may not be aware of this, but they don't have much of a bill of rights compared to us. And they can get in a boatload of trouble for saying what they said. But they're, they're trying to live out being a good shepherd in a culture that is just going... Ugh the wrong way. Actually, that is leadership. True leadership. That is a true love that we can trust. One of the marks of revival that happens in God's church. How many of you would love to see a revival in God's church? Yes. One of the marks of it is not high-octane worship. That doesn't cost us anything. Because there's no self-denial in that, really. Might even reinforce selfishness because I only want to sing a certain type of thing I want to sing. So it's not music. Jonathan Edwards said, you know what real revival is? True revival awakens a new sense of our responsibility to one another. Which is contrary to our selfishness, as he goes on to say. And therefore, a more revealing indicator of the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. When John the Baptist was announcing the coming of God's kingdom, the people asked him what they should do, and he told them, well, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. It's basically, if if God's presence is among us, we will not say, the person over there is not my responsibility. We will help people. And those of us, who lead should exert that influence in our personalities, in our lifestyles. We should be life enrichers through the power of the Holy Spirit, not life depleters. Have you ever been around people that just suck you dry? That's not what we're supposed to be. See, in verses 1 through 15 here, our prophet Isaiah foresees loss for the whole generation. The loss of being in this permanent residency and stability of the people of Israel as real leaders were disappearing. People were stumbling into confusion. 
But as we will see in a few moments, this loss God remedies with great gain. He gives the Messiah. Now the second section really of this part of Isaiah says that God is taking something else away. The loss of regalia in verses 16 through 24. And it's really an interesting section of Scripture. Look at verse 16. Moreover, the Lord said, Because the daughters of Zion are proud and walk with heads held high and seductive eyes and go along with mincing steps and tinkle the the bangles on their feet, therefore the Lord will afflict the scalp of the daughters of Zion with scabs and the Lord will make their foreheads bare. In In the day the Lord will take away the beauty of their anklets, headbands, crescent ornaments, dangling earrings, bracelets, veils, headdresses, ankle chains, sashes, perfume boxes, amulets, I don't even know what that is, finger rings, nose rings, festive robes, outer tunics, cloaks, money purses, hand mirrors, undergarments, turbans, and veils. Wow, the mall is toast. Verse 24, the word, the key word appears here in verse 24. We see it five times starting here, instead of, instead of, all right? Just giving you a heads up. Verse 24, now it will come about that instead of sweet perfume, there will be putrefaction, putrefaction. Try to say that quickly. Instead of a belt, a rope. Instead of a well-set hair, a plucked out scalp. Instead of fine clothes, a donning of sackcloth. And brandling instead of beauty. Your men will fall by the sword and your mighty ones in battle. And her gates will lament and mourn. And deserted she will sit on the ground. God is describing capture and exile and destruction and abuse. And in verse 16 says, because the daughters of Zion are proud. Wow, the evil of pride raises its head again, right? Pride is what made an angel into a devil. Into the devil. First Timothy 3 6, and not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation occurred by the devil. Conceited, proud. You know what's going on here? And this is what's scary. What's going on here is the complete anti God state of mind. And you have to sit there and look at our culture today and go, yup, this is scary. We're seeing this all over again. When their pride forced God into this action, God exchanged the instead of statements there, their pretense with reality. This is how you looked, but this is actually who you are. This is how you tried to be, but this is who you actually are. And life tailed off into an unspeakable sadness for years. This inventory of jewels and fancy clothes stands parallel with the list of big shot leaders that were removed. Do you catch it's everyone? It's both the men and the women? In their own ways, they all fall short of the glory of God. The swagger of the guys, the false beauty of the women. All of them had pride in their hearts.
they were not living to the glory of the Lord. They were not living for the glory God created us for. You know, if you, if you want to jump into the New Testament, just for a few moments there, there's some scriptures behind me in 1 Timothy and 1 Peter that, that talk about the, the secret beauty of Christian women, for example. And it's really about the radiance of the Holy Spirit. 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10, Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modesty and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments. See, it's all the stuff that was over here in Isaiah. Isn't that interesting? But rather by means of good works, as is proper for women, making a claim. What are, so, making a claim to what? Verse 10, godliness. What claim are you making? 1 Peter 3, 4, Peter then says, so we've got, we've got Paul saying it, now we've got Peter saying, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. You know what is missing in both 1 Timothy there and 1 Peter? Pride. Pride's missing. Godliness, gentle, quiet spirit, precious in the sight of God. Actually, you know what? I would argue that the world does not have a category for that type of beauty, but that is the beauty that God brings about. A a God-filled person, a God-filled guy is going to lead like God wants him to lead and is going to take care of the people, all people. A God-filled woman is beautiful. She's dressed properly for the occasion. We've been talking about this in various times and various weeks. What is the ultimate occasion for Christians that this woman is dressed for? The church is the bride of Christ, the wedding feast of the Lamb, the coming day when the Lord alone will be exalted, going back to Isaiah chapter 2. And the desperation that we see here of this tragedy of the the men and the, the women that are filled with pride and and are not living for the glory of the Lord, but living for their own glory and their pride is just dripping out and it's just awful. And it's desperation of trying to look good when you're not well, when you're sick. You're sick inside. Look at verse 1 of chapter 4. For seven, for seven women will take hold of one man in that day, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes, only to be called by your name. Take away our reproach. It's just pitiful. It's desperate. And then the desperate men, verse 3, verse 6, chapter 3, verse 6, when a man lays hold of his brother in his father's house, saying, you have a cloak, you shall be our ruler, and these ruins will be under your charge. There's, everyone's desperate because there's no leaders. There's, there's no one. God has removed this. The loss is awful. God has taken away what? Supply, support. Supply, support. Verse 26, empty, she shall sit on the ground, which is a metaphorical lady of Jerusalem at that point. See, God's people in this will suffer loss, and God is the one actually doing it. He's taking away what they need to stabilize and beautify their lives 
for real. The risen Jesus said this to his church in Revelation chapter 3. You say, I am rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich in white garments, so that you may clothe yourselves, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and solve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. I will come to you, it says in Revelation 2, I will come to you and take away your lampstand from its place unless you repent. What happened in the day of Isaiah? Lampstand, gone, took it away. The loss was meant to prepare for gain, though. Verse 2 of chapter 4. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. This vision that then happens here is as beautiful as what was terrible. So please switch gears. The vision that is going to happen here, that is happening here, that we're now looking at here, is awesome. We read these words, in that day. You see, after the painful stripping, what's next? God doesn't threaten more loss. Instead, he creates something new. Better than what he took away. The branch of the Lord with the parallel, the fruit of the earth. There is a metaphor for who? The Messiah. Israel is contrasting the beautiful humility of our Messiah, a sprout, a twig, a gro- growing from the line of David with the absurd magnificence of the ugliness of Jerusalem's women that was stripped away. Later, the prophet will write in Isaiah 53, He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. Jesus replaces false beauty with true desirability. The branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious in verse 2. And the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adornment of the survival survivors of Israel. It will come about, verse 3, that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy, everyone who is recorded for life in Jerusalem. When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning, then the Lord will create over the whole area of Mount of Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day, even smoke, and the brightness of a flaming fire by night. This sounds familiar if you know your Bible. For over all the glory will be a canopy. There will be a shelter to give shade from the heat by day, a refuge and protection from the storm and the rain. Jesus himself, everyone, Jesus himself will stand forth as our only beauty. God will be creating something new, a cloud by day, a flaming fire by night that we see in Exodus 40. God filled the tabernacle that way. 1 Kings 8 saw the glory of God filling the temple this way. Isaiah is thinking of this presence of God, but now with a difference. 
on the final day of the Lord, the glory will not just be filling a tabernacle or a temple. What will it be doing? It's covering the whole site of Mount Zion. All of her assemblies. The rivers of nations that are flowing up to the mountain, as we said earlier in this over the last few weeks. God is moving us, everyone in this room, God is moving us towards a time when His glorious presence will cover His whole church and all the gatherings of all believers. And I actually believe that it has already started in the expression of the New Testament church today. His true people in His true church. It's kind of cool to think of a wedding canopy over this building right now. Jesus is gone and is preparing a place for us. And the display of his glory is not going to be intimidating as it was in Mount Sinai. But we're going to be sheltered. It is presence forever. Everything is going to be perfect. I was kind of searching around well how how do you how do you explain this how how do you capture the vivid picture that Isaiah is giving here in words that someone could say today and I think Jonathan Edwards did a really good job with this section when he said There the glorious God is manifested and shines forth in full glory in beams of love. And there the glorious fountain forever flows forth in streams, yea, in rivers of love and delight. And these rivers swell, as it were, to an ocean of love in which the souls of the ransom may bathe with the sweetest enjoyment and their hearts, as it were, be deluged with love. So let us end where we began. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain this. To gain this picture that we see of perfection. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain this which we can never lose. Lord, we thank you.